welcome back to IT Track. Today we will talk about routing loops and what can happen when we are trying to do redistribution across multiple routing domains. And you can see the topology I have set up here. I just kind of ripped it from the CCMP route book, uh, the 300-101 book, and actually the same exact topology is in the 642-902 book. But it's pretty cool, and what we're going to do is take a look at the major problem right off the bat, and we'll look at R4. R4 is going to try to trace route to this RIP network up here. Logically looking at this topology, we would think, okay, it's going to go through R8, and R8 is going to bop over to R9, and boom, he's going to be in the RIP network. But the routers are not going to think like humans. They are going to think like routers, and he's going to make a bunch of weird choices about where to send this packet. So we'll get into R4. I'll just show IP interface brief with everything that's up and we'll see he's got these IP addresses assigned from that topology. The interfaces are up, they're up on all the routers, so let's do a trace route. Trace route 172.20.0.9 and what happens? Boom, he just loops around. In fact, the only thing that kills this process or kills this looping is the default maximum PTL on the router of 30. So what's the path he's thinking is the best to get to this network? R4 thinks that the best way to get to the network is through RD2. And RD2 is sending that information because he thinks the best way to get to the network is ultimately through RD1. And RD1 actually thinks the best way to get to the network is back through R4. So they're all trying to get to this RIP network, and they are having a big problem. And they just go around and around and around like this forever. So let's take a look specifically of what exactly is happening in this topology and what we can do to fix it. So let's assume that this network started just with OSPF. And maybe it was, you know, company A. And they were running... OSPF is their main routing protocol to have communication between all their subnets and networks and everybody was happy. And then they decided to buy or merge with company B. And company B was not running OSPF. They were running EIGRP. So in order to have all these networks talk to each other, what did they have to do? They basically had to put a router in the middle, which we will call a redistribution router. And what it did was it did mutual redistribution between these two routing protocols. So it took OSPF information, translated it into a language that EIGRP could understand, and did the same thing going the other way. Took all the information received from EIGRP on these two interfaces and threw them into the OSPF network so OSPF could understand it. And then all the networks were communicating and everybody could reach everybody and, and things were good. And then let's say maybe they decided to add another router here to do redistribution for redundancy purposes or load balancing or both. And still everything was pretty much okay because when you have OSPF on one side and you have EIGRP on the other side, the fact that EIGRP has two administrative distances one is 90 for any internally learned routes through EIGRP, and the other one is 170 if the route is learned through an external source. So if we take a look, let's say that we have all these networks in the OSPF domain. RD1 takes these, throws them into EIGRP, and all these routers assign an AD value of 170 to that route learned. So that includes RD2. So when he learns about that route coming through here and all the neighbor relationships will not advertise that. He will not re-advertise that into OSPF because he already has a route to that network with a lower AD value. And by default, routers will never advertise a route that they don't have in the routing table. So he's not going to say, well, it's not good enough for me, but it's good enough for you. He's basically going to say, if it's not good enough for me, I'm not going to do anything with it. So he doesn't re-advertise that route. And the same thing happens the other way. Let's say this router is redistributing these routes from ERGRP into OSPF. Every route that he knows that he's redistributing has a default AD of 90 because they're internally learned through EIGRP. So he's going to redistribute them, and that's cool. And all these routers are going to learn it. 
and they are going to assign their OSPF AB to the learned route as 110. And the same thing for RD1. He's going to learn this 110 route, and he is not going to re-advertise that back into the EIGRP domain because he already has a route for that as 90. The AD is lower. He's not going to throw that back out there. So even with two redistribution points or multiple redistribution points, you're not going to have a problem with OSPF and EIGRP. So let me clear this off. Okay, so now let's take a look at what happens when we add a third routing domain to the mix here. In this case, the RIP network. So we'll just assume that after everything was set up and everything's okay and everything's working, this company decided to buy some smaller company. And the smaller company, company C, was running RIP. So how do we make sure that everybody can talk to everybody and all these networks can see each other? Well, we have to do redistribution now through R9. And this is where the problem can happen and why we're going to get the looping problem uh, on R4. So basically, we have this 172.20 network. R9 takes it. He advertises it into the EIGRP domain. And all the routers here learn about it. They throw it in the routing table, and they assign it a value of an administrative distance value of 170 because it's learned via external EIGRP. So RD1 gets this information, and he says, oh, there's a new network here. I have to redistribute this into OSPF. And he does that, and all these routers learn about this network and assign their default AD OSPF values of 110. Lo and behold, RD2 now has this choice to make. He has two different sources for the same information. One is on his serial interface in the EIGRP network. He has a route to the 172.20 network with an AD of 170. But now he's learning about the same network through OSPF and the AD is 110. So what's he going to do? Well, he's going to pick the OSPF route because the AD is lower. I mean, it's really a no-brainer for him because that's what he's told to do. Lower is better when it comes to administrative distance. So herein lies the problem because he gets this. He basically says, this is a better way to get to that network. So I'm going to advertise this better way through my redistribution process into EIGRP. So that gets over to R4. R4 now has a problem. He is now getting two sources of information with the same administrative distance. He has an AD of 170 for this externally learned route through RD2, and he also has an AD of 170 for this externally learned route through his communication or his neighbor relationship with R8. So what does he choose? Well, if the ADs tie, he's going to look at the value of the metric in EIGRP. And if the metric is lower going to RD2, that's the path he's going to take. So it really depends. Whatever the redistribution values are on these two routers is really what's going to determine the path he takes to get to the RIP network. And in our case, the metric value is lower going to this router, so he's going to take it. And not only that, he advertises that lower metric route to all these guys as well. He advertises that through his neighbor relationship with R8 and with RD1. So let me clear this off because he thinks the best path is going through here. And RD1 also learns about this new way to get to the network. And when he compares metric values, he finds, oh, it's quicker to get through here than through here. So I'm going to send it back to R4 if I want to get to the 172 network. And that's what happens. So we have this huge mess. All right, so let's get in these routers and take a look and see what they're doing and what we can do to change this routing loop situation we have here. So if we go to R4, well, I'll tell you what, let's go to R9. We're going to look at the redistribution values that I'm setting for RIP and enhanced die grip. So we'll do a show run uh, section router. I have router EIGRP10, and I'm redistributing RIP with these basically bogus values. I mean, it's just 11111. One, 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 one. 
it's not representative of the actual link speed or anything like that. So I can go in there and change that. Config T router EIGRP10. Redistribute rip metric. So let's say it's an Ethernet link. I can do 10,000, 1,000. 255, 1, So he's going to calculate the metric differently now. And if I go into show IP route on R4, he's actually going to point to R8 because his EIGRP value or metric that he uses to reach that network is much lower. It's much more appealing to him instead of the 1 through RD2. In fact, if I do a trace route, he should find his way to the, the RIP network now. And he goes through R8, and he hits the network. He goes through here. R8 forwards it to R9, and everything's good. So if I go back, if I go back to R9, let's say I change this. Let's say the link is not fast Ethernet. Let's say it's you know, a 256k link. We'll change these values to actually represent the link speed of what it's pulling. And what happens? Let's see, show IP route, include 172.20.0.0. Now he's going back to the other route. He's going back to RD2. So we have the same problem. 172.20.0.9. And he's going to loop. Uh, so really, changing the redistribution values is not, I mean, it can work and it can help, but you're still going to have a problem. And what is that problem? Even if we go back to here and we make it so it will point through, it will point to R8 to get out to the RIP network, RD2 is still going to have what's called a suboptimal path, or he's going to use suboptimal routing to get to that network. Because his AD for OSPF is lower than the one through EIGRP, he's never going to take that route through EIGRP. In fact, we can see this. He's going to... RD2 is always going to go through R2 to R1, and then R1 will pass him along, even if we change that route, because he's not even listening to it at this point. RD2 doesn't care the, the metric for EIGRP because he's going to use OSPF no matter what. And this also kind of brings us to another point. Redistribution is not a permanent solution, really, for this problem. I mean, what's the best outcome for this network is to have one routing protocol, either OSPF or EIGRP. You know, it's just a temporary measure, usually, or hopefully. So... Redistribution is a temporary solution for networks that are not running the same routing protocols. Okay, so we're going to go in and fix this problem. There are several ways you can do this, and I'm going to show you one right now. And what we're going to do is we're going to go into RD1 and RD2. First, we'll start with RD2, and we're going to tell them, look, if you receive an advertisement from RD1 about this 172.20.0.0 network in OSPF, don't listen to it. And by don't listen to it, we mean we're going to set an AD value of 171 to that route. And we're going to do the same thing on RD1. We're going to say, if you receive an advertisement from RD2 through OSPF about this 172.20 network, assign an administrative distance value of 171, which is in effect telling it to ignore it because it's greater than the AD value it already knows from enhanced eye grip. So let's do that. We will go to RD2 first. And first we're going to set up an access list to identify the 172.20 network. So IP access list standard. IP access list standard. I'm going to call it RIP. And permit host 172.20.0.0. Now we'll go into the OSPF configuration, router OSPF1. And we're going to tell it, we're going to manually assign an administrative distance to this route learn. We're going to say distance 171. And basically, it could be any value greater than the default for external EIGRP routes of 170. 
So distance, 171, 1.1.1.1. This is the router ID of RD1. 0 .0 .0 .0. When you receive this information from a router with this particular router ID, assign it a distance value of 171. And this is the name of our access list. And we're also going to do this on RD1. And the exact same thing. Config T. IP access list. Standard. RIP. Permit. Host. 172.20.0.0. And then we'll go into router OSPF1. Distance. 171. 2.2.2.2.0.0.0.0. So that is the router ID of RD2. RIP. Assign an administrative distance of 171. If you hear an advertisement, an LSA, if you get an LSA regarding this 172.20 network from RD2. Now, let's go to RD2 and see what happened. Show IP route. So what do we have? He is now ignoring the OSPF AD for that route because it's higher than the one that he's learning through EIGRP of 170. So if we do a trace route, 172.20.0.9, he's taking the path that he should. He's not doing any of this suboptimal routing. He's basically going from here to R4, the R8, the R9. And RD1 should be doing the same thing. I mean, basically, he is not going to figure out that it's easier to get to that route through RD2. He is going to take the right path going right to R8 to R9. Let's see it. Trace route 172.20.0.9. And he's just going right over there, R8. So let's look at R4. What does R4 have in its routing table now? Show IP route section 172.20.0.0. And he is showing us the same thing. He's going, even though it's got a really high metric because of the redistribution, it doesn't matter because that's the only thing he's hearing now. That's the only thing he's listening to. So he's going to go through R8 to get there. And we'll do a trace route. Trace route 172.20.0.9. And there he goes. Right away, he's going right through it. So that's one way to fix it. We can also do it via route maps. And that will be a video for another day. So I hope you enjoyed this tutorial. Routing loops are pretty cool. This is a great exercise to screw around with and kind of get the feel of what happens when these routers are learning information. So thanks again for watching, and I hope you got something out of this video. We will see you next time.